Chair recognizes Chairman Dempsey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House insist on its position on SB 374. Chairman Dempsey has moved that this House insist on its position with regard to Senate Bill 374. The clerk will read the caption. Senate Bill 374 by Senator Tillery, the 19th, Upstetler, the 52nd, Burke of the 11th, and Kennedy, the 18th, be entitled an act to amend Part 3 of Article 4, Chapter 12, Title 45, the official code of Georgia annotator relating to the Georgia Data Analytics Center. So as it provides for definitions, this bill have referred to the Committee on Judiciary. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Dempsey to explain the motion data bill that we passed the senate disagreed and amended it and it needs further work we insist on the house version chairman dempsey has moved that the house insist on its position on senate bill 374 is there objection the chair hears none and this house has insisted on its position on senate bill 374 Chair recognizes Representative Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the House insist on its position on SB 516. Representative Buckner moves that this House insist on its position on Senate Bill 516, the clerk will read the caption. Senate Bill 516 by Senator Robertson, the 29th, follows the 53rd, and others to be entitled an act to amend Part 1 of Article 2 of Chapter 8 of Title 12 of the Official Code of Georgia Annotator relating to general provisions of solid waste management, so as to require the Environmental Protection Division to contract with the Department of Revenue to collect certain fees. Chair recognizes Representative Buckner to explain her motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The House made some changes to Senate Bill 516 after we got some additional information from the Department of Revenue. Uh, the Senate did not necessarily agree with those changes, but we are very close to an agreement if we could just get to conference and work out a couple of details. Thank you. Representative Buckner has moved that this House insist on its position on Senate Bill 516. Is there objection? The chair hears none in the House has insisted on its position on Senate Bill 516. All right, we're going back now to the um, supplemental rules calendar and the clerk will read the caption. 
<coughs> to House Resolution 798. House Resolution 798, on the remainder of the 56th. A resolution creating the Joint Study Committee for Cannabis Waste Disposal and Recycling. This resolution has been referred to the Committee on Regulated Industries. That committee recommends this resolution be adopted by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Representative Maynard to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is House Resolution 798. The state of Georgia has been doing a lot with cannabis and the plant of cannabis, we use just a portion of it and most of the plant is not used and so this is a study committee to look at all of the different things that we can do with the cannabis waste. And I would love your support in HR 798. I yield the will. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none, the previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? Chair hears none, the committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none, the report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye, those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. What purpose does Representative Bentley rise? She waves. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines. On the adoption of House Resolution 798, the ayes are 153, the nays are 3. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to House Resolution 881. House Resolution 881 by Representative Jackson, the 128th and others, a resolution encouraging each public school in the state to study the civil rights era and related subjects described herein to affirm their commitment of the free peoples of the state to reject bigotry. This resolution has been referred to the Committee on Education. That committee recommends that this bill do, this resolution be adopted by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Representative Mac Jackson to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you House Resolution 881. I want to thank Speaker Ralston, Chairman Dave Belton, Representative Al Williams, Representative Matt Glanton, Representative Will Wade, Representative Chris Irvin, and Representative Carolyn Hughley for the work they did on this resolution. This is a fitting resolution to honor the teachings of nonviolence as taught by Dr. King. As most of us know, April 4th, 1968, was the day that Dr. King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee. And this resolution encouraged each public school in this state to study the civil rights era. There's no greater authority on the destructive nature of bigotry than there is to be, than a better cure than the working philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his principles of nonviolence and social justice toward productive goals. We have a letter here from Mayor Andre Dickens supporting this bill and others. And Mr. Speaker, that's the gist of the bill, and I ask for your favorable consideration if there are no questions. You have a question if you care to yield. I yield. Chair recognizes Representative Holly up in the gallery for, for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does the gentleman yield? I do. Just want to thank you, sir, for working amongst his colleagues here in the spirit of bipartisanship, as well as having the faith to know that you can touch this issue and show that it is not a divisive concept, but it's certainly one that we've unified. Under. Thank you. Thank you. You have no further questions. I yield the will. 
We have another member that wished to speak on the bill. The chair recognizes Chairman Dave Belton to speak to the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really appreciate the uh, speaker's leadership as well on this uh, really necessary resolution and also my uh, relationship with uh, Representative Mac Jackson, also Al Williams. You know, it's easy to talk about the things we're against, but what are we for? And this is what we're for, where if we believe Dr. King's nonviolent principles of social justice provide the best antidote to what is ailing this nation. We also believe there's no greater authority nor a better cure than Dr. King's principles of servant leadership. Civility and tolerance have to be learned. They do not automatically come to us through one generation to another. Our children need to learn the value of each and every human life. You know, Dr. King didn't cancel Thomas Jefferson. He celebrated our founding fathers. He invoked the famous promissory note based embracing the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The Citizens' Resolution is not just about the past. It's about celebrating the victory on an international scale, the, the transcendent message of Dr. King. And it's about teaching our new generation how places like the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia, the White Revolution in Afghanistan, the Carnation Revolution in Portugal, the People Power Movement in the Philippines, the Solidarity Movement in P Poland, the Singing Revolution in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, the liberation of Bulgaria, the Golianade of Romania, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and most recently and most importantly, the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine in 2004 that gave those brave Ukrainians the freedom in the first place. These things did not happen by accident. They were taught in large measure by the words of Dr. King. Missouri has made a similar resolution. So has Pennsylvania, Colorado, Texas, Tennessee, South Carolina. I urge Georgia to do the same. I yield the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the adoption of House Resolution 881, the ayes are 160, the nays are zero. This resolution having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. I'm going to ask all members of the House to please take your seats. All members, please take your seats. Madam Doorkeeper. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Brian P. Kemp and his guests wait entrance to the House Chamber. Madam Doorkeeper, please allow the Honorable Brian P. Kemp, Governor of Georgia, and his party to enter the chamber of this body.
Members will please come to order. This house will come to order. All members will find seats. We are truly honored to be visited tonight by a uh, special Georgian that has been a leader in this state now for um, coming up on three and a half years, I guess. Uh, um, Brian Kemp's made some tough decisions. You know, it's easy to talk. Deciding is hard. Governing is hard. And he's had to govern through some very, very challenging times, and he's governed well. And um, I appreciate uh, the uh, uh, great working relationship that he and I have had, and he and this body this session and over the years. And I'm just delighted that he and his family would join us tonight with First Lady Marty Kemp and the girls are here. Please help me welcome to the podium the governor of Georgia, Brian P. Kemp. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Speaker Ralston, Speaker Pro Tem Jones, Leader Burns and Beverly. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I want to thank you for allowing Marty and the girls and me the opportunity to join you at the start of what I'm sure will be a very quick rest of the evening. <laughs> I will say this, Mr. Speaker, this House has governed through some tough times, too, and your governor's appreciative of that. Once again, we end where we started, together. Perhaps a little worse for wear, after long nights of study and passionate debate since I first addressed this chamber back in January but no less dedicated to the hardworking people of Georgia that we are privileged to serve. I know you have miles to go before Speaker Ralston can officially proclaim Sine die, so I'll be brief. But this has been a historic legislative session, and not just because of the unprecedented corniness of Don Hogan's daily jokes. In my State of the State address, I called for a teacher pay raise of $2,000, fully delivering on a promise to raise salaries of those leading our classroom by $5,000 in my first term. An additional $1.4 billion in direct funding for our K-12 schools, so that we invest now more per student than ever before. Legislation to ensure parents have full access to their child's education and children are not being exposed to obscene materials. The addition of 1,300 health care program slots through USG, TCSG, and other institutions. A priority of this House, the expansion of Medicaid coverage for new mothers to a full year. Funding for a new anti-gang unit in the Attorney General's office, enabling legislation to give Attorney General Chris Carr the ability to partner with the GBI and local law enforcement to investigate and prosecute these dangerous criminals. An additional trooper class of 75 cadets and pay raises for our brave men and women in state law enforcement. Expansion of high career programs to include law enforcement and criminal justice degrees. Legislation to add human trafficking to the list of serious, violent, and sexual offenses that require a Superior Court judge to grant bail. Something I know that our First Lady Marty Kemp and the girls are our, and I are especially appreciative of. I also want to thank them for all that they've done to advance this cause and how you all have helped them. And I've asked for other budget and legislative items that prioritize education, health care, in public safety. 81 days have passed since I delivered that address, and in that time you had delivered on every one of these items. 
and much more, including a refund of over a billion dollars back in the pockets of hardworking Georgians, a gas tax suspension, and a tax exemption for career military service members. And you delivered on truly something that is very mon monumental. With unanimous bipartisan support, along with your counterparts across the hall, the Speaker's Mental Health Parity Bill, which I had the honor of signing earlier today. Congratulations. As I said at the bill signing with the passage of HB 1013, Speaker Ralston, Spiro Ambrin, their staff, Representatives Mary Margaret Oliver and Todd Jones and everyone in this chamber has truly made history. Congratulations again on that great achievement. It is yet another reason why people will talk about this session for years and possibly generations to come. So on behalf of the entire Kemp family, Everyone on my staff and all Georgians, thank you for your leadership. But as I always say, we must never rest on our laurels. And we've got a little bit work, a little bit of work left to do this evening. Specifically, as the evening progresses, I'm looking forward to continuing the critically important conversation on the best ways to achieve an income tax cut for hardworking Georgians on fairness in school sports, divisive concepts, and I know you've got to pass that historic 23 of budget, Chairman England. Thank you for your work on that. As our time together this session draws short, I want to especially acknowledge those who have elected not to return to this show that never ends. We're saying goodbye to many dedicated public servants, too many to name in full, in each an institution in this historic place in their own right. But there's one in particular I want to single out, Dean Smyrie, soon to be ambassador. Over the course of nearly a half a century working under this gold dome, you have broken barriers, both witnessed and made Georgia history. And as you told me early on, you have been the glue that hold this place together. It's been an honor serving beside you, sir. You're a man of character, and I congratulate you on a life and career well spent serving others. Thank you again. Smiley Marty's a bigger fan of you than I am. <laughs> In my state of the state, I quoted Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. As we head off into the rest of this year, I think those are good words of wisdom for all of us to remember. Good luck the rest of the evening. Keep chopping, and God bless you, and thank you for your service. Hey, thanks for having me.
House will come back to order. Clerk will read the caption to House Resolution 1050. House Resolution 1050 by Representative Smith of the 70th and others. A resolution recognizing and commemorating the outstanding advancements in water conservation that have been made by Atlanta Metro Regions and all Jordans. This resolution has been referred to the Committee on Natural Resources and Environment. That committee recommends that this resolution be adopted. Chair recognizes Chairman Lynn Smith to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the House. I bring to you today House Resolution 1050. When I was first elected to office, my slogan about the Chattahoochee River was that you didn't need to see it, you could just smell it because it was that bad. Atlanta was polluting our waters all over the state and it was a very serious situation. And we also entered into water wars with our neighboring states. So Atlanta had a crisis. I was there when the General Assembly began taking action to deal with this crisis. And so for over 20 years, I have watched water policy evolve out of what I call the core four, which was Chairman Hanner and Richard Royal and um, Tom McCall and then myself. We were the steady hands throughout this, this initiative. I'm the last one standing holding this baton our General Assembly works like a relay team. We reinvent ourselves every two years. And so the importance of this urging resolution is to tell you not to get comfortable because we've got a lot of rain and we're very comfortable right now with our situation. We will always have tension between our states and we will have periods of time when we have no water. The crisis can become very serious. Those of you who live in the metro Atlanta area need to one time go check for that tunnel that was built with a drill bit on a train track cutting through the granite to get to an old rock quarry in downtown Atlanta to have one or two days worth of water supply for Atlanta. Our state was facing a very serious crisis around 2008. We were in a serious drought and then we had a judge's ruling that threw us back to 1970 water use. I'm telling you all of this because it's easy to get casual when we have abundant resources. The urging part of this resolution is to remind you to always stay vigilant in this, in this important issue. And secondly, to ask you to pause and take for a minute and understand in the urging part of the resolution that we are very dependent on our agriculture business in the state of Georgia, but we are becoming more and more removed from understanding the needs of our farmers. And if I asked you to explain to me what civil culture was and what mariculture was, and then talk to me about agriculture, I think some of you would have to pause and think about this. And so I wanna congratulate Metropolitan Atlanta for its 20 years of very diligent improvement of its water, system, water situation. They are good neighbors to all of us in our state. They provide us with data and information. That was not the situation years ago. So I leave you to urge you to continue looking at our water supplies. The first few lines are about what Atlanta did. Starting on line 41, it talks to you about what the rest of the state did. There's a House resolution on your desk, privilege resolution, that lists in detail the water legislation. So think of this as a relay race. I'm the last one holding the folded up umbrella baton, and I pass it to you, the General Assembly, to continue being good stewards of our water resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield for questions. No questions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the well. Is there any objection <coughs> to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. Previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution the chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines.
Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of, on the adoption of House Resolution 1050. The ayes are 164, the nays are zero. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Clerk will read the caption to House Resolution 1149. House Resolution 1149 by Representative Washburn of the 141st, the resolution creating the House Study Committee on Regulation, Affordability, and Access to Housing. This resolution having been referred to the Committee on Small Business Development, that committee recommends that this resolution be adopted. Chair recognizes Representative Washburn to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise to present House Resolution 1149, which proposes the creation of a House Study Committee on Regulation, Affordability, and Access to Housing and for other purposes. I think we all would agree that uh, we see an awful lot in the media today about what is becoming a housing crisis in Georgia. We have a crisis of availability, affordability, and access to housing. And this study committee proposes a committee that will study that. It will be composed of four members of the House. Uh, the speaker shall designate one of such legislative members as chairperson of the committee. It will have a real estate industry professional, a serving mayor or a county commissioner, and another individual who at the speaker's discretion will be a serving mayor or a county commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, affordable, accessible housing is important to our citizens. It's a basic need of shelter. And it is also, in many cases, most of the time, if a house is purchased, it's a great investment for a family. It is also very important to our economy. The housing industry is one of the engines that drives the, the Georgia economy. And this is an important study committee. I believe it's a, it will be a balanced committee. And I think it will do good work in studying our situation with housing. And so, Mr. Speaker, I urge uh, favorable consideration of this um, re resolution, but I will yield for any questions. You uh, have some questions if you care to yield. I will yield for some, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Chair recognizes Dean Smyre to your left for a question. Uh, to the gentleman in the well, I certainly will, Dean. Glad to see you bringing this forward. Now, it, it, the study committee is for affordability and housing, and we're going across the state measuring this issue as it relates to affordable housing. Yes, yeah, so we are looking at affordable housing and a number of other issues. Right, thank you. We certainly are. Thank you. Do you further yield? I'll take one more, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Camp to your left for a question. Does the gentleman yield? I will for my realtor colleague. Um, well, I was doing some statistics trying to determine a need for this. Is it true that um, in the past 12 months, from 4-4 of 2021, houses under 300,000, there have been 66,000 houses to sell in the past year under that amount. And right now there is a mere 2,800 excuse me, houses under 300,000 on the market, meaning there's only about 15 days supply of houses on what would be deemed affordable. And $300,000, I'm going to say, is a stretch for a lot of people in affordability. Um, is that the purpose of your study? Uh, the purpose of our study is to ensure a number of things, private property rights, uh, freedom of choice, uh, affordability, and a number of other things. And I know that the lady is a residential specialist who does a lot of real estate business, and I'm sure she knows of what she speaks. Mr. Speaker, I will yield the well and ask for favorable consideration of this resolution for a study committee. Gentleman has yielded the well. We have two other members that wish to be heard. Chair recognizes Representative Momdahan to speak to the bill or the resolution.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the House. In the four years that I've been a member here, I've never opposed the bill or resolution for that, for that fact. And I come here today to oppose this bill, I think, to maybe unmask what this resolution is actually doing. This year, we've heard several things about affordable housing. We've heard how we, we've got to address this issue. How are we going to do it? We're going to do it through uh, all sorts of things uh, by restricting the ability of local governments and the constitutional authority that they have to provide zoning regulations for their communities. That's the power that's vested in them in the Constitution. But after that bill couldn't make it to the Senate Judiciary Committee or the House Judiciary Committee, we are, we are here. We arrive here today to study a bill or a solution that isn't actually going to bring us more affordable housing for our workforce in Georgia, but rather do the exact opposite. And that is to make housing less affordable under the guise of big conglomerates that are coming from out of state that are buying up every scrap of land in our communities and jacking up the rates on rent to where a working young adult in Paulding County who graduates from Paulding County High School and is a welder who goes to our local uh, technical school can't even afford the rent that's there. That's who's behind this. In Paulding County, when I look online, the average cost of rent for, from the companies who have been behind this thus far is almost $3,000 a month. And when you ask them, how, how long can you rent for? They only allow you to rent for nine months before increasing your rent again. I've got too many constituents. I've got too many children back home who can't afford housing. And if we allow these big national companies to come in and steamroll every inch, there won't be anything left for our children. I would ask that you vote no on this bill. Will that, Mr. Speaker, I yield the well? The gentleman has yielded the well. The chair recognizes to speak to the bill. Representative McLaurin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the last time. This, this is a promise from the heart. This is the last time. And I'm not going to try to be as funny as it was or you know, try to be funny, whatever, like last time. Um, the reason I'm up here is my respect for the member from Paulding County. That's my reason for opposing this bill is a spirit that it's so elusive, right? But if we can hold on to it, we have it bipartisan agreement about something. The issue with this study committee is that it's a withdrawal from, a step back from another initiative, which was to preempt local governments from regulating whether external investors could buy up a lot of land and neighborhoods and, and you know, rent those properties out. And I'm with the representative on this. The study committee is geared in that direction. Now, granted, we would love to have voices on that committee who can truly assess affordability. Uh, but all else held equal, we don't need to be giving that local preemption argument uh, room to breathe. I'll keep it short. At the end of the day, you know, I told you in my previous speech I've learned a lot from being here. <laughs> uh, value the relationships a lot. This is a moment when I think we could do better on affordability, on affordable housing. This is not the study committee to do it because this is in the direction of 
certain moneyed interests who showed up this session, put a lot of money into this uh, to try to get a particular outcome. And so uh, the representative and I agree. That's all I'll leave you with. It's been the honor of my life to serve here. And uh, I hope to keep in touch with everybody and hopefully just be across all. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Yield the will. Gentleman has yielded the will. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. What purpose does Representative Ridley rise? Your inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that the gentleman from Paulding County just stood over here earlier and said that he agreed that we should have a study committee instead of making this a bill? Well, I was um, probably not paying as much as attention as I should have to what he said, Representative. I know so you wasn't, Mr. Speaker, but he did say that. What purpose does Representative Fry rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Mr. Speaker, is it not true that regardless of what people perceive the motivations of this committee is for, that studying affordable housing in today's climate is a good thing for this House to do? I'm sure the gentleman believes that to be true. All right, we'll do one or two more. What purpose does the majority leader of the House rise? State your inquiry. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, isn't it true that this will be a great opportunity to bring local governments together and have a discussion on this matter. And also, don't we all, isn't it further true, Mr. Speaker, that one of the goals of every person is to own a home? And isn't it further true that sometimes we have to rent first before we're able to achieve home ownership? And discussing this issue in, in this study committee will make sure this issue is thoroughly vetted and all concerns are discussed and taken into concern for future legislation possibly. Is that true, Mr. Speaker? Well, that's the purpose of a study committee as opposed to having a bill, I think. Chair recognizes Chairman Burchett. What purpose does he rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. <clears throat> Isn't it true, Mr. Speaker, that the there is a new concept um, of a whole subdivisions being owned by one entity, and when there are new concepts, it's, it would behoove us as a state to study those things to see how to best take advantage for the citizens of the state of Georgia. I'm sure the gentleman believes that to be true. Um, all right, final one. Uh, what purpose does Chairman Rich rise? Parliamentary inquiry. inquiry. Isn't it true that this study committee is to facilitate legislation that failed in both the House and the Senate this year and that had testimony from both affordable housing advocates and also affluent and struggling economically, economically, economically struggling cities? Well, if the lady so states, I'm sure she believes that to be true. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of House Resolution 1149. The ayes are 114, the nays are 43. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore adopted. Clerk will read the caption to SR-135. SR-135 by Senator Mullis, the 53rd, and Kowser the fort of the 46th. Proposing an amendment to the Constitution of the State of Georgia so as to provide for sports betting in this state. This resolution having been referred to the Committee on Economic Development and Tourism, that committee recommends that this resolution be adopted by committee substitute. You rascal, you. I didn't you know you were in this. What's your favorite game? <laughs> Chair recognizes Chairman Watson. 
to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am a Baptist, so I don't, I don't know that I could go there, but uh, I do want to say, first of all, that this uh, SR 135 has nothing to do with gambling. Uh, if, if you have not read uh, 135 uh, on your desk, uh, this is a substitute to uh, reinsert the language uh, that we had on our House Bill 686 uh, dealing with uh, the forestry uh, severance tax where we're lowering it to 40 percent from 100 percent to create some fairness there in, uh, in the taxation. Uh, that bill passed this House 106 to uh, zero, so I would greatly appreciate your support. Uh, Georgia is the number one forestry state in the nation, and we want to make sure that we stay there, and this bill will do this uh, for us. So I uh, greatly appreciate your support, and uh, Mr. Speaker, I'll be glad to take any questions if there are any. Well, you do have a question. Do you yield? Uh, yes, sir. I'll yield for one. Chair recognizes Representative Dreyer to your left for a question. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I just want to be clear that if this constitutional amendment is passed, we would be giving um, property owners tax incentives to cut trees down. Is that right? No. The way, the way it works, when trees are, are ready for harvest, and, and they're sold, they are taxed on the revenue that's generated from that selling of the timber. Currently it's taxed at 100%. We tax all over other property at 40%. So what we're saying is that we will tax the landowner who cut the trees at harvest at the 40% level like we do everything else, and then we'll reimburse the local governments for the difference to make up the 100%. And then the landowner is actually able to take some of that revenue that they put in their pocket and replant those trees back immediately. So this is a, a good bill to protect our forest, to keep folks uh, planting them back after they harvest and provide fairness within the bill. Does the gentleman further yield? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, but they wouldn't have to get tax incentives to replant those trees if they didn't cut those trees down to start with, correct? Well, that's, uh, that's true, but if they don't cut them down at a certain point, they're going to they'll wither, they could fall, they'll be infested, and it's good for our env environment once to, to have old trees, but also to have young trees uh, that help the environment. So the older they get, uh, they're not as viable as having those new young trees. Um, and so that's, that's why we think this is a good bill to, to keep into play. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to withdrawing the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn. Is there any objection to adopting the substitute offered by the committee on rules? The chair hears none. The rules committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection? to agreeing to the report of the committee which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution. The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. What purpose does Representative Al Williams rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true, Mr. Speaker, that if these trees are not cut, housing costs will really take off? And is it not further true that if these trees are not cut, small landowners will have no income and no incentive to replant? Uh, that sounds like a fair statement to me, but I know the gentleman knows much more about that than I do. What purpose does Representative Sains rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true that the gentleman who spoke against the process used by our hardworking timber harvesters was speaking from a wooden desk? <laughs> you, you really want me to answer that? Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of Senate Resolution 135. The ayes are 160, the nays are 6. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed.
Clerk will read the caption to SR 477. Senate Resolution 477 by Senator Mullis, the 53rd, Miller, the 49th, a resolution creating the Joint Study, the Joint Georgia Music Heritage Study Committee. This resolution having been referred to the Committee on Creative Arts and Entertainment, that committee recommends that this resolution be adopted. Chair recognizes Chairman Carpenter to present the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senate Resolution 477 is a simple bill. It just creates a joint study committee with the House and the Senate to study the economic impacts of m music, music tourism, tour production, and the Georgia Music Hall of Fame. It's a simple bill, and I think it, it addresses an important issue in our state in, re in regards to music and the, all the musical talent that we've had. The, the best part about this bill is lines five through eight that discuss not only o Otis Redding and James Brown and Little Richard, but uh, Usher, Outkast, and Young Jeezy. And with that, I'll yield the well and ask for your favorable consideration. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the adoption of the resolution? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this resolution now be adopted? All those in favor of the adoption of the resolution will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines. Chair, um, uh, have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the adoption of Senate Resolution 477. The ayes are 159, the nays are four. This resolution, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 89. Senate Bill 89 by Senator Miller, the 49th, Albers, the 56th, and others to be entitled an act to amend Chapter 2 of Title 21 of the Official Code of Georgia annotated relating to elections and primaries generally, so as to provide for a chief elections assistance officer. This bill, having referred to the Special Committee on Election Integrity, that committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute.
chair. The chair recognizes Chairman Gunter to present the bill. Here we go. All right, thank you, Madam Speaker. Senate Bill 89 uh, is a election bill originally. Uh, it was stripped out and was replaced with a greatly modified version of 1464. So I want to go through the bill with you and uh, explain the differences in it. Section 1 is a uh, clarifying who the members of the Performance Review Board are. Section 2 uh, requires that uh, ballots are securely stored in sealed and locked containers accompanied by a ballot transfer form. The State Election Board is required to promulgate rules and regulations regarding the security and handling of unused security paper. Section 3 is the provision where employers are required to uh, allow their employees to go uh, vote in early voting or in the election. Section 4 and 5 uh, remove the language of sealing the uh, election documents. Uh, this makes it so that you don't need a court order to go look at the documents when they're stored with the custodian or the clerk of the court. Section 6 is that provision where these documents are uh, deposited with the custodian or the clerk and, and how they are to handle them. Uh, they're to hold them for 24 months, and they are do to do it in a manner so as to prevent the ballots from being altered, amended, damaged, modified, or mutilated. In addition to that, there was a provision added, uh, 8.1 on lines 161 through 163. Upon certification of all matters on the ballot in a particular election, all such documents from the election shall be subject to inspection pursuant to 21272. That's an old statute that's been on the books since the 1933 code or some version of it, uh, but it sets out the parameters for which uh, an inspection can be done. Uh, section 7 is the original jurisdiction for the GBI. Uh, in that, we modified that a bit to uh, state that uh, the investigation, that the GBI would have authority to investigate violations of Chapter 2 of Title 21 involving elections which, if established, are sufficient to change or place in doubt the results of the election. Section 8 is the uh, subpoena power provision that we had in 1464 before. And uh, Madam Speaker, I'll take any questions. You have some questions. The Chair recognizes Representative McLeod for a question. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Do you disagree with the Secretary of State who said that the 2020 election was a secured one? Do you disagree with your Secretary of State? I, I don't recall him saying that. Yes, he did. Uh, do you further yield? Yes. Will this create additional burden to our counties? I would think not. This is, uh, like I said, greatly modified from 1464. A lot of the uh, chain of custody provisions, all of that is out of here, uh, except there is, uh, let's see, I think the only place in it is the uh, section two, where it uh, puts it for the state election board to work those details out. Does the gentleman further yield? Yes. So are you sure, because are you sure that the election supervisors agree with this bill that it will not cost them any more issues in their county? The ones that I spoke to at the last meeting, that was their assessment of The ones that you spoke to. Yes. Thank you. Chair recognizes Representative Williams for a question. Does the gentleman yield? I yield. Is this not the same bill we passed out of committee this morning? It is. Yeah, uh, but there was some, um, was there not uh, some election supervisors there, directors of elections who approved this bill and was favorable for it? They were in on talking about some of the issues of the bill. That is correct. And I appreciate your hard work and leadership on this, uh, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. Great bill. All right. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield the well. Gentleman has yielded the well.
chair recognizes Representative Clark to speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Colleagues, today I rise to ask you to vote no on this bill. First, let's talk about how we got here. As the sponsor just stated, this bill started as HB 1464, which was a 39-page bill that no one asked for, including the governor, that would have put a bunch of unfunded mandates onto our county election boards and expand the powers and duties of the GBI to include investigating um, elections violations. When that bill was heard in the House, election officials were not really given a good opportunity to speak on that bill before it was rushed through and passed out of the committee. However, by the time the bill made it to the Senate, election board officials from across the state, rural election board officials, metropolitan Atlanta election board officials, Republican election board officials, Democratic election board officials, all of them, or many of them, made their way to the Capitol to make their voice heard. Since they are the ones who have to implement these requirements and pay for these requirements that are in this bill, I think it is very important that we consider their perspective. And before I talk about that, I want to talk about who came. We had election board officials from Bartow County. We had election board officials from Forsyth County. We had election board officials from Macon Bibb, Newton, Henry, Heard, Athens Clark, Chatham, Fulton, all over the state. After hearing from those election board officials, again, these are the people who have to run the elections in their county. After hearing from them, the Senate completely removed all of that damaging language from HB 1464. After listening to the people who run elections, they remove the language, and then we turn around and put it into another bill. So you may not care about my perspective on this bill, but do you care about the perspective of the vice chair and GOP appointee to the Forsyth County Board of Elections, Joel Nat, who stated in the committee in the Senate that this language is very damaging and would cause him to lose poll workers. It's already hard enough to recruit poll workers. This bill will make it worse. It will make it harder. Why are we doing this to these election boards officials that are asking us nicely, please do not do this? Why is it that our colleagues across the rotunda can listen to the election board officials, but here on the House side, we have decided that their voice does not matter and we're going to ram this through anyway. Additionally, this bill will shift the duties of investigating election violations from the State Elections Board to the GBI. This is an intimidation tactic it will not only be used against your voters, but could also be used against organizations and those county election board officials or their workers. Again, they already have a hard enough time getting poll workers and now you wanna sick the GBI on them? What are we doing here? I am asking you to vote no on this bill because I listened to the election board officials from across the state, the election board officials that run the elections in your counties, 
and they said, do not do this. Ladies and gentlemen, please vote no on this bill. If we want to do this, let's hear from them. Let's hear their input and put something together that actually uses the voices of the people that have to implement elections. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Representative Wynn to speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Pro Tem. It's April 2022, our last day of session, and here we are still rehashing an election that was held in November of 2020. Over the weekend, I, along with many of you, received emails from Georgians who are still asking us to decertify the results of the election. So I want to try to be short here because we have rehashed this over and over and over again. The governor promised no new election bills. He just came into this chamber. And when he talked about his priorities, I did not hear him say, we got to pass an election bill. You all were there. You heard the same thing I did. Two, the Senate vetted House Bill 1464 and heard from a bipartisan group of election officials, and they declined to pass it. And this bill, it contains many of those same provisions. It was heard in committee this morning at 8 a.m. with no public comment, so I'm not sure how some members were able to hear from election officials. But when I watched that committee meeting, there was no public comment. And those same election officials who told the Senate that they did not want House Bill 1464 did not have the chance to speak this morning. And so here we are on the last day of session with a bill that a lot of folks really don't want to pass. And it's a bill that will not restore faith in the election system. I have a couple of ideas how we can do that. One and two are pretty simple. One, stop passing legislation predicated on the big lie. Two, stop running campaigns predicated on the big lie. Three, we should actually all agree on this. Equip and resource our local election boards with what they need to run free, fair, and efficient elections in their jurisdictions. This should really actually be logical because we have heard from election officials all across our state and they are trying right now to, to follow the guidelines that this body passed under Senate Bill 202. They are getting ready for elections that will happen in just a couple of weeks and many of our members are going to be on that ballot with new redistricting maps. And election workers are quitting because of threats, because of mandates, and because of lack of resources. We know that this bill will further burden our election workers. And guess what? We are not funding any of these mandates for our local election boards. And we are facing an election administration crisis, and we are making it worse. And finally, let's not militarize our election system. Giving power to the GBI will not restore confidence, and in fact, it may cause intimidation to local election boards, officials, and to voters. The state election board already has investigative powers and the expertise to look into any cases or allegations. This is also fiscally responsible because in our state budget, somehow we found over half a million dollars allocated in this budget to fund positions for GBI to do something that we actually don't need. And somehow we can't find funding for our local election boards. So we're going to keep going down this road and it has no end because nothing you will do short of overturning election results of 2020 will satisfy a base that cannot accept facts. And I want to close with a quote from the Bartow election supervisor who was very clear about this bill. Joseph Kirk said, focus should be on improving the voter experience, not strange procedural steps to make a small portion of our population feel better about an election that happened two years ago. 
I yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Representative Hutchinson to speak to the bell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, I'm gonna be honest. I had to go home this weekend to New Orleans. It was my aunt's 80th birthday. And we have a great party no matter what this, the, the occasion is. So I was partying all weekend, yes. So I had to plagiarize my speech. So I was looking for quotes or something to inspire me because goodness knows we have talked about everything when it comes to voting rights on both sides. So I really honestly just didn't know what to say, so I plagiarized. So here's some of the things that I got when I Googled it. When dealing with explicitly enumerated rights, but we need to is a weak argument from the get-go. It is especially weak when it is untrue. Talking about the big lie. It's an explicitly enumerated right, but we need to restrict it for something that was not true. This was a safe election, according to both sides of the aisle. Here's another one. We believe that it's a basic human right to vote. It is a privilege to vote. It is our job as the people to make sure that voting is in the right hands. Here's another one. Just think about when we fight to defend our rights and our voting rights, especially when they are so often under attack. Well, my friends, let me tell you, our votes are once again under attack. They're trying to take away our rights to vote, which is enshrined in our Constitution. Here's another one. We always have to fight for our rights, whether we do it at the ballot box or we do it at the General Assembly. Here's another one. Every one of us shares the same core convictions core convictions no matter what they are. I have some of those same core convictions, convic convictions that our founding fathers did. They believed that every man and woman had a right to vote. My core conviction goes back to what our country was rooted on, what our foundation is rooted on. Our rights come to us from God, not lawmakers. It's God who gave us our rights. Our founding fathers believed that. They talked about it. When people try to take away our, found, our foundational understanding that this was a nation founded under God, we always have to fight to defend that because that's the core of what they're trying to do, to take away and undermine our values. Now, I have to give credit to the, to the people who I plagiarized from. The first person I plagiarized from was the NRA. I plagiarized from the NRA because they know how important gun rights are. Because it's a constitutional right. Am I correct? It's a constitutional right. And talking about gun rights and gun safety is a non-starter at best. I don't understand, I honestly don't understand. I came here as a social worker, not a lawyer. I still don't understand why the constitutional right of carrying a gun cannot be touched under any circumstances. Or according to the NRA, the militia is gonna come if we do. But our voting rights, which is also a constitutional right, can be messed with at all times. Also my uterus, but that's another bill. I just wonder, some of my colleagues who will not even discuss gun rights, how they would feel if the GBI is watching you when you buy a gun, or the GBI is watching you to make sure you use your gun correctly. I have a feeling that would not fly here. However, here we are, attacking voting rights again. And now we have the GBI involved as well. So I really, really would like someone to explain to me which rights are more important in the Constitution. Is there a rank that I'm missing? Because I just, I, I still don't understand. And with that, I'll yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Representative Dreyer to speak to the bill. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to be really clear on the most important thing here. You are giving the governor of the state of Georgia the power to seize ballots while they are being counted. That's what this bill does. Look, lines 227 and 228 gives the GBI additional jurisdiction to investigate elections. Line 240 to 244, that's where the problem lies. You're giving the GBI the power to issue subpoenas to seize documents and electronic media. So if the GBI identifies potential election fraud, the GBI can now issue a subpoena to go grab ballots while they are being counted. But how does that relate to the governor? You know who fires and hires the director of the GBI, right? It's the governor. It's the governor. So we saw with the last president when there was an investigation into campaign issues, there were two FBI directors that were fired. But what we're doing here is we are authorizing the executive branch of the state of Georgia to meddle in our elections. It's separation of powers. And I know some of you are going to sincerely tell me this governor is not going to do that. Okay, maybe. What about the next governor or the governor after or the governor after that? And even if this governor is not going to do that, I don't trust him with that power anyway. We talk about separation of powers under the Constitution, but what we're giving the governor the power to do is to stop the counting of ballots if the governor sees exit polls that he doesn't like on May 24th of this year. Six, seven weeks from now, if the current governor thinks he's going to lose his primary challenge to David Perdue, he can order the GBI to seize ballots and voting machines in certain counties. He can also do that in November of this year, or our next governor, she can do that in four years and a few months. And you are authorizing that power. There is nothing compelling to the point that it would have us waive our right as a separate but equal legislative body and give the governor of the state of Georgia the power to overturn an election through the GBI. I got to tell you, that is too much power for anyone to have when it comes to our elections. And instead of looking at how we can make voting better, we're looking at how to give this governor too much power. I'll tell you, we can solve the issues with voter registration, simply do what other states do and guarantee that not one of us has another constituent that loses the chance to cast a vote because they're not registered or their voting registration got purged. We can do it very simply by allowing same-day voter registration. Second thing we can do is we can make sure not a single constituent loses the right to vote because they're at the wrong precinct, often not because of their fault, because it's been moved or combined or some other reason by letting people vote at any precinct in their county on election day. And we've been pushing those. Why are we afraid of what people are going to tell us at the polls? Why are we afraid of everybody voting in our state? Is that because some positions aren't popular? Is it because we don't trust people down deep? 
I trust people. I challenge you to trust people to make the right decision. Because a lot of people are happy making decisions for other people, but you would never let someone else make a decision for them. Finally, 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 do not authorize the governor of the state of Georgia either this year or in five years to overturn their own election for no reason. Please. Stand up for the Georgia Constitution. Stand up for separation of powers. If you have to walk, take a walk. But please don't vote for this bill because if we're ever in a situation where there's a governor that's willing to abuse the powers, and that's going to happen, believe me, we've seen it, then, then we're done at that point. And then you're going to have some really mad constituents, I tell you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield the well. The gentleman has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. For what purpose does Representative Cannon rise? To make a motion. State your inquiry. I move to table this bill. The lady has. <clears throat> The lady has moved that um, House bill, Senate Bill 89 be tabled. All members who are in favor of tabling Senate Bill 89 will vote yes. All those who opposed tabling Senate Bill 89 will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the lady's motion that Senate Bill 89 be tabled. The yeas were 60. Eight, the nays were 96, and the motion has failed. Is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to, favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. The chair will take. The chair, the chair will take one uh, parliamentary inquiry. For what purpose does Representative Williams rise? Just, just parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, is it not true that I was Chief Registrar in Baldwin County for 16 years? Chair expects the member to believe that to be true. And I was in many elections. And this morning I was in a committee meeting and the election supervisor, Joseph Kirk from Bartow County, was brought up to the table and he discussed with legislative council, Chairman Powell, myself, and he was very fine with this bill. I'm sure the gentleman believes that to be true. Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill, the yeas were 96, the nays were 69. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. Clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 338. Senate Bill 338.
Senate Bill 338 by Senator Burke of the 11th, House Statler of the 52nd, and others to be entitled an act to amend Article 7 of Chapter 4, Title 49 of the Fisher Code of Georgia annotated relating to medical assistance generally, so as to increase postpartum coverage under Medicaid from six months to one year following birth. This bill, bill I have referred to the Committee on Health and Human Services. That committee recommends that this bill. Chair recognizes Chairman Cooper to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members of the House, I bring you Senate Bill 338. This would have Medicaid cover uh, mothers from the post postpartum uh, period following their delivery for 12 months instead of the six months which we have now. We are still having a problem with maternity mortality, and many of the illnesses are not found in that first six months period. Consider what it would be like if you had grown up without your mother. Uh, Madam Speaker, with that, I will yield the will and ask for your considerable, for, uh, consideration on this bill. Thank you. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Representative Cannon to speak to the bill. Thank you very much. I am proud to support this policy because I, like other black women in this chamber, have been working on this bill for years. Let's get into what happens when a recently pregnant person dies. There is an option to fill out a box on the review form for pregnancy-related and pregnancy-associated deaths as to whether or not discrimination was a part of the death. As of right now, our health agency, the Department of Public Health, does not yet have what they need to make conclusions on whether discrimination was identified as a contributing factor. DPH said, results should be interpreted with caution due to the high number of missing information. More robust data is expected in the future as the Maternal Mortality Review Committee continues reviewing. You see, we are one of the worst states in this country for childbirth the mortality rate, both for mothers and for children. I would ask for your attention in this chamber as we are talking about black mothers dying. I like this bill, but it's just the tip of the iceberg because pregnant people in our state deserve more. They deserve a doula, a certified childbirth educator, and someone who can assist with breastfeeding. The current biggest obstacle for accessibility to childbirth workers is cost. The Council of State Governments, of which I am a Henry Toll Fellow, reported that doulas have been proven to improve I'll the birthing you know experience. By minimizing hypertension, epidural usage, instrument-assisted delivery, and time in labor, I'm here to say that this measure is good and that I'm proud that our legislature will significantly help mothers by expanding Medicaid for one year to cover this necessary childbirth expense, but don't get too comfortable. Families are suffering without coverage when their loved one dies within one year of childbirth. So far, legislative action to increase accessibility to doulas has been happening in southern states like Texas and in Florida, as well as in states with better health outcomes such as New Jersey, Maryland, and Rhode Island. Georgia should not lag behind these other states in giving mothers safer childbirth options. When we don't offer mothers the maximum coverage up to one year they need to safely bring another human into the world, we gamble with their lives. This bill is a first step, but it is not doing enough. Other states have given us models for common sense legislation, such as paying doulas a livable wage. But we must take this initiative and add to it, just like we did last year, by adding six months. We need stronger legislation to protect our most medically vulnerable citizens. I urge you to show that black mamas matter and vote yes. Trust black women and show up for reproductive justice. Thank you, I yield the word. 
The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes Representative Shannon to speak to the bill. I rise to speak in support of this bill. I'm glad that we're seeing this bill, but I just want to talk a little bit about the history of how we, how we came to expand postpartum Medicaid in Georgia. Um, for many years now, we had seen reproductive justice groups talk about the need to expand Medicaid and also the need to reduce maternal mortality. We've had some of the worst rates um, internationally and for a long time Georgia has been on the list of having um, rates that are extremely high of maternal mortality. In 2019 when this house was moving to ban abortion, um, I was the first to sponsor a bill to expand Medicaid for those who have just given birth. It was House Bill 693, and it asked this General Assembly to expand postpartum Medicaid for up to a year. The reason why I feel that, well, the reason why I filed that bill is because we know that maternal mortality tracks those who have died due to complications from carrying pregnancy, both while giving birth and up to a year after giving birth. The representative from House District 58 got the fiscal note for HB 693. And then at that point, we assembled a group of legislators who worked with reproductive justice organizations to build support for the idea locally. Former Representative Abel Mabel Thomas was instrumental in helping us build support for this. Over the course of a year, reproductive justice orgs met to build public awareness about the issues of maternal mortality and to also build support and to make the General Assembly aware that we needed to pass postpartum Medicaid, expand postpartum Medicaid. Formal, former Representative Abel Mabel Thomas, um, the representative from District 58, met and myself met with these groups nearly every single month. It was an entire coalition. I want to thank the budget chairman who, from the first time I had a conversation with him about expanding Medicaid, he immediately saw the value in this idea and he never just shucked it off as something partisan that should not be considered. And since the time that it was passed, he has worked to make sure that it is included in every single budget and I'm grateful for that. At one point, the organizations that were working on building awareness um, for this issue and, and were building support for this issue sent a letter that I delivered to the chairman and I'm gonna read it. To the Honorable Terry England Chairman, House Appropriations Committee, Dear Chairman England, this letter is from January 27, 2020. We, the undersigned organizations, are a coalition of concerned Georgians working to improve outcomes in maternal health. We request that the provisions be made in the FY 2021 budget to extend postpartum Medicaid coverage of mothers in our state up to one year. Implementation of this policy would be one of the many necessary steps to addressing the maternal mortality and morbidity crisis in Georgia. Data shows that Georgia has the worst maternal mortality ratio of any state in the country. Black women in Georgia are 3.3 times more likely to die from pregnancy-related complications than white women are. And Georgia's own health experts believe that more than half of confirmed pregnancy-related deaths in the state are preventable. Based on the latest report from the Georgia State Mandated Maternal Mortality Review Committee, 82% of maternal deaths occurred in the postpartum period, up to one year. Yet women enrolled in Medicaid for pregnancy lose coverage only 60 days after giving delivery. Children born to women who are covered by Medicaid during pregnancy are automatically eligible for Medicaid or child health insurance program for one year. Unfortunately, this same length of coverage is not extended to the mothers of these children. Extending Medicaid coverage of moms to one year after they deliver will ensure that they will have access to critical health care services and demonstrate that Georgia's values, Georgia values uh, health care. This recommendation has been made by both the state's Maternal Mortality Review Committee as well as the General Assembly's own recently convened Special Study Committee on Maternal Mortality, chaired by Representative Sharon Cooper. We acknowledge the great strides in improving maternal health made by the General Assembly over the past two years, and we urge lawmakers to continue proposing and passing legislation that creates opportunities to achieve optimal standard of maternal health. These opportunities start with access to safe and respectful health care. 
Please allocate funds for extension of postpartum Medicaid coverage for women up to one year in the FY21 budget. Sincerely, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, Center for Black Women's Wellness, Center for Reproductive Rights, Citizens for Community Midwives, Community Midwives National Alliance, Dr. Shalom's Maternal Action Project, Handmaid's Coalition of Georgia, Midtown Assistance Center, No Safe Seats, Sister Love, Sister Song, SOE Agency, and the United Way of Greater Atlanta. After the letter was delivered, some weeks passed, and we did see that postpartum Medicaid was expanded um, for six months on the House side. Again, I want to thank former Representative Abel Mabel Thomas, who left her lasting legacy on the General Assembly by making sure that this bill passed in the Senate. She put her all into it, and as a result, we are saving lives. Access to health care is life-saving, and I'm glad that the state has recognized that it's life-saving for those who have just given birth. What I would ask is that we would choose to give access to health care for all low-income Georgians who need it, because it shouldn't be the case that the state is only primarily interested in saving your life if you've just given birth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The lady has yielded the well. The chair recognizes the last speaker, Representative Bennett, to speak to the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise this evening in support of Senate Bill 338 and urge you to, and urge us, the House, to pass it unanimously. Did you know that 93% of maternal deaths were determined to be preventable in 2017? DPH has just finished the, DPH finished a 2019 Maternal Mortality Review Committee. However, the data has not uh, been revealed yet. But we know from the data in 2017 that maternal mortality has a devastating point of 52% of pregnancies associated during that could be avoidable. We also know that 39% of the pregnancy associated deaths occurs 181 days up to one year postpartum. As a mother and a pastor myself, I know that these issues impact not only immediately, but have long-lasting impact and effects on communities and the family. The leading causes of pregnancy-related deaths in our state are hemorrhage, followed by infection and cardiovascular disease and coronary conditions. Expanding access to Medicaid for pregnant families is the right thing to do. So I'd like to thank the um, members of Georgia Legislative Black Caucus who had this as a priority in our agenda when I served as chair. And I also urge you to vote yes to this bill, this life-saving bill. Georgia ranks number uh, 55 now in our health rankings, and this will go a long way to saving lives and improving our health rankings. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield the well. The lady has yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the yeas were 142, the nays were 18. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. Clerk, read the caption of Senate Bill 352. Senate Bill 352. Senate Bill 352 by Senator Thompson, the 14th, Alvarez, the 56th, and others being titled back to to amend Chapter 1 of Title 43, the official code of George Ann Taylor relating the general provisions of professions and businesses so as to provide for the issuance of expedited licenses by endorsement for certain licenses to spouses of firefighters. This bill I refer to the Committee on Regulated Industries. That committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. 
Chair recognizes Chairman Martin to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Senate Bill 352 is going to be a path to help us to bring firefighters, health care providers, and law enforcement officers to the state. All three of these professions are in short supply, and it does that by allowing their spouses to get uh, licenses through endorsement. It's just that simple. It lets them start. Uh, with somebody that is practicing in another state, moves into our state, holds a license to practice, they're able to start quicker and get a license faster. It simply does that if you're a spouse of a firefighter, a police officer, or a healthcare worker. We've done this before for the military. Um, it, it's simple. They have to abide by all of our laws. This just gives them a way to use the experience they've maintained. Madam Speaker, if there are no technical questions, I'll yield the well and ask the House's favorable consideration on there, Senate Bill 352 to help jobs in Georgia. There are no questions. I yield the well. The gentleman's yielded the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. Is there any objection to withdrawing the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is withdrawn. Is there any objection to adopting the substitute offered by the committee on rules? The chair hears none. The rules committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All in favor of the passage of the bill will vote yes. All those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine. For what purpose does Representative Barr rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Is it not true, Madam Chair, that that presentation by that distinguished member of this body is the shortest in my tenure here? The chair expects the man to believe that to be true. Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of the bill the yeas were 164, the nays were zero. The bill having received the requisite constitutional majority is therefore passed. The chair recognizes Representative Smith for a motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that the House agree to the Senate substitute to House Bill 1291. Representative Smith has moved that the House agree to the Senate substitute to House Bill 1291. The clerk will read the caption. House Bill 1291 by Representative Smith of the 133rd and others being titled Act to Amend Code Section 4883 of the Official Code of Georgia and Taylor relating to exemptions from sales and use tax so as to revise the spend, spending threshold and extend the sunset date for sales tax exemptions. Chair recognizes Representative Smith to explain the Senate substitute. Thank you, Madam Chair. House Bill 1291 is the high-tech bill that we passed here in the, in the House a few weeks ago by a vote of 150 to uh, 17. Uh, it's, when it got to the Senate, they combined uh, Representative Williams's bill, which was a data center bill, and put it on. These incentives are used by the Department of Economic Development to draw these big industries here to Georgia, and they have a great workforce and pay some great salaries in our area across the state. So I certainly ask for your consideration in this agreement. Thank you, Madam Chair. There are no questions, and the gentleman has yielded the well on the gentleman's motion that the House agree to the Senate substitute to House Bill 1291. All those in favor will vote yes, all those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machine.
Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the gentleman's motion. The yeas were 150, the nays were 16, and the House has agreed to the Senate substitute to House Bill 1291. Clerk, clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 259. Senate Bill 259 by Senator Mullis, the 53rd, Gooch, the 51st, and others be entitled an act to amend Article 4, Chapter 11 of Title 16 of the Official Code of Georgia Antetta relating to dangerous instrumentalities and practices so as to revise various laws pertaining to firearms in the carrying and possession of firearms and other weapons. This bill I have referred to the Committee on Public Safety and Homeland Security. The committee recommends that this bill do pass by committee substitute. Chair recognizes Chairman Alan Powell to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and ladies and gentlemen of the House. I bring you tonight Senate Bill 259. 259 is a cleanup bill on the firearms rights across the state. A lot of the issues that we had detected over the years on the Department of Public Safety and a lot of that was brought to us by a lot of the members. And I'll give these to you quickly because the hour is getting late. Section one, ladies and gentlemen, deals with correcting language that was created eight years ago dealing with houses of worship. At the time that we did the uh, concealed weapon law at that time, churches and houses of worships were considered off limits to firearms. But the only problem with that was when we did that, we created a, a major problem to a lot of the houses of worship. At that particular time and currently, a church must choose to either allow anyone or no one to carry a firearm. That's not correct. What we're doing in this bill is to allow that a church may choose who they want to bring, let them have a weapon in a church. You ask what's the issue with this? Open shootings. Churches have normally been considered fair game to a lot of the criminal elements and people mentally unstable that want to do open shootings. Now, I've been questioned, and this is probably one of the most interesting parts of this bill, but I've been contacted by people with synagogues here in the, in the chamber, a lot of the larger churches, and they say, well, we don't like that because we hire our own security teams. Well, you can hire a security team because most of those are uh, law enforcement or post or trained or whatever. But you've got to remember that across the width and breadth of this state, there's a lot of churches that don't have the funds or the resources to hire security teams. And these churches have every right to choose who they wish, if anyone, to be armed in a church to protect that congregation during their meetings. That's what that part of the bill does. Uh, section two, ladies and gentlemen. This deals with probate courts. Uh, as you know, we just passed constitutional carry, but as a lot of y'all know that some of us has, have said that you should still keep a concealed weapons permit for this purpose of reciprocity with other states and for your purchase rights. This allows the probate judges to implement an online application process, and it also allows that renewals can be, applications can be sent in by first class mail. Also the second part of that prohibits building of a database of any licensee in the state. Section three deals with the 10 acre uh, property. We have a situation, ladies and gentlemen, that 10 acres of property is in fact uh, used by a lot of people to hunt on their own property or people that they wish to hunt. And what we're saying in that is that that if you have 10 acres of property, that local governments cannot ban you for discharging a firearm. We put specific language to calm the nerves of AC, uh, ACCG and GMA that this has nothing to do with prohibiting zoning or anything else if they want to do it. It just says that if you have property, then you can hunt on that 10 acres. We had one of the members of the committee or one of the members who was in attendance the other day, when he heard this, he said, well, this affects me. He said, I have 60 acres that was annexed into the city and I can't even hunt on my own property anymore. So that's what the 10 acre rule does, ladies and gentlemen. 
Section four deals with the disposal of weapons. We have certain jurisdictions that aren't following the law today that says they're supposed to dispose of weapons that they have, working weapons and legal weapons that they have confiscated. These are being built up in warehouses. Under testimony over the last few years, we've had a lot of the uh, folks say that a lot of those weapons seem to always disappear from these warehouses. We're saying that they've got law enforcement agency has to have an auction once every 12 months or when they get over five weapons built up and get rid of them, auction them off. But remember, they're not auctioning these to individuals. These have to be auctioned off to a federally licensed gun dealer. Section five deals with the process of regaining your rights. And I would encourage you to read through that, but it's all the legal process that once you've been adjudicated either mentally ill or for whatever reason, at some point, once you've regained or got control of your senses or whatever it may be, you actually have a right to go to court and to petition to have your constitutional rights restored. Section five, section five, does six, five six and seven does exactly that. Puts it in sync with the federal laws so that there is a due process to go to court to prove that you are over whatever that condition may be. Section eight deals with the state of emergency procedures. Basically, quite basically, it says what the governor can and can't do and it expands the type of the gun related action, actions that a governor or government official may take during a declared state of an emergency to include seizure of ammunition, reloading equipment, prohibitions on the manufacture, sale, or transfer of firearms. Your constitutional rights and legal rights are protected at that point. That, ladies and gentlemen, is exactly what this bill does. Um, I would encourage each member in here to look at this. This is a very good bill. It's been worked on for quite a while, and this would ensure everybody's constitutional rights. I don't know that there's need to answer questions, but I'll be glad to, so we can move on down the road and get some other bills taken care of. You've got some questions, do you yield? Just a few and very quickly, Mr. Speaker. Chair recognizes Representative Stacy Evans to your left for a question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the gentleman yield? Yes, ma'am. We were having fun while it lasted, weren't we? Agreeing on everything. I said we were having fun while it lasted, agreeing on everything together, weren't we? Yeah, you made, according to the speaker, you made me a lot more intelligent, so I must be intelligent enough to be handling this bill. That, that's very good. See, it's working already. I actually just have an informational question. Um, if the constitutional carry bill goes all the way through here and over there, and there's been a couple of versions, so I'm not sure where we are, but the governor ultimately signs it, what's the impact on this bill because it seems like that bill would sort of swallow this and whole different subject matter Constant nothing in this would constitutional be constitutional carry basically says that you if you are qualified under the concealed weapon then you can carry a weapon without having a permit or anything just as long as you're not a felon not a mental adjudicated as a mental health risk has nothing to do with anything in here these are the working nuts and bolts of the second amendment in georgia or the firearms rights in this state thank you thank you do you further yield yes sir one more chair recognizes representative mcleod to your left for a question does the gentleman yield yes ma'am so your solution to gun violence is more guns i'm not sure of your observation about that I don't know about gun violence. I've always said that the best friend that you can have when you're being assaulted by a criminal is a citizen with a weapon that knows how to use it. Is that the good guy with the gun? If you don't mind mumbling, I can't hear you. Is, is that the, um, does the, does the gentleman further yield? Yes, ma'am. Is that the saying that a good guy with a gun is a good thing? Is that, is, is that in the realm of what you speak of basically someone with a gun is, I guess, better than someone without a gun? Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you want to exercise your constitutional rights and you're legally able to, then that's your business. 
We have that. Yes, sir. I, I, I agree. We do have a Second Amendment in our Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would certainly appreciate the members' favorable consideration. And let's get this piece out of the way to help. Uh, one is to ensure people's constitutional rights to adjudicate uh, their cases in court and help these churches who have been, and a lot of the churches have been prompted to disobey their own commandments on this, on the current language. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman has yielded the well. The um, other members wish to be heard on the bill. The chair recognizes Representative Jenkins to speak to the bill. Mr. Speaker, members of the House, I rise in support of SB 259, and I want to speak specifically to uh, Section 3, and that's the section that uh, limits the ability of municipalities, uh, counties, and consolidated governments to restrict uh, the discharge of firearms on tracts of land larger than 10 acres. Uh, my family did farm in the city. We had approximately 200 acres that was annexed into a city with no track large, smaller than about 60 acres. And we lost the ability to, uh, to discharge firearms, to hunt, uh, because at the end of the day, one farmer can't outvote a subdivision. You know, and a lot of times these cities don't understand the importance uh, that hunting and, um, is, is to managing a piece of property. Farmers are the custodians of our green spaces. Uh, we appreciate these, but ultimately, you know, if you're conducting agriculture, you have to be able to manage primarily the deer populations on your land uh, in order to get any kind of harvest. And, you know, our, our urban areas are full of farmers doing just that. Um, and this gives them the tools they need. The Department of Natural Resources has set up uh, a very good structure to our hunting seasons and all our rules uh, to properly manage uh, our, our wildlife populations in this state. But when, when these rules run up against these ordinances that prohibit uh, the discharge of firearm and consequently hunting, uh, then that doesn't occur. Uh, it's been over 20 years ago when, when I was last in uniform as a police officer in Clayton County, but to my surprise, when I went to, to morning watch, you know, I found one of the first things I did every morning was euthanize deer on uh, the loop road around the Air Atlanta airport. And, you know, some of the largest deer are, are in urban areas because there's no way to hunt them there. Um, statistically, uh, Henry and Fayette County are actually uh, two have, have the most uh, deer-related accidents because, again, these are urban counties with large rural tracks in there, and so many of them are closed to hunting. Uh, so in conclusion, I thank the, the folks that brought this bill. This is a good bill. This protects our Second Amendment right. It allows uh, particularly our urban farmers to, to manage their property and uh, take care of their livelihoods. Mr. Speaker, with that, I yield the well. Chair recognizes to speak to the bill Representative Becky Evans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I rise in opposition to Senate Bill 259. I believe in safe gun ownership laws and reducing easy access to guns, not more guns everywhere. Section 1 deals with places of worship. Places of worship are sacred. They should be safe. I have heard the arguments that churches should be treated as private property. Places of worship are God's property. Guns are tools of violence. What is our fifth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. Guns kill. The current law works. Where, current, where churches specifically permit the carrying of weapons and long guns into the sanctuary. Current law allows for armed security in the church if the church wants that. 
Most churches do not want concealed lethal weapons in their sanctuary or long guns in their sanctuaries. In section three, regarding these properties of 10 acres or less, current law works where the local municipality or county or consolidated governments can prohibit the discharge of firearms on local properties of 10 acres or more. They know their communities best. They have access to zoning information and know about future plans for recreational facilities and ballparks. They would be responsible for stray bullets shot from the barrel of a gun that might accidentally kill children on these properties. I also spoke with another member who owns properties of over 10 acres uh, earlier tonight. And he was talking about he likes to have the freedom for his children to run around on these properties. And if his, is, if his neighbor with 10 acres or more is shooting guns on their property, that could put people on his property at risk. So this bill takes away local control and prohibits local governments from that right and responsibility. Section four, unclaimed firearms. When I told my husband at dinner about this provision, requiring municipal corporations to sell firearms once a year, and if they don't, for individuals to be able to sue them, he was asking me, why? Why is this required? And I didn't have a good answer. Now I've listened more and I hear what, uh, what uh, the chairman has said, that law enforcement uh, can sell these guns. But what I would say is current law works. They can do that now. Local control works. Most of the time they do have these annual sales. I understand that this legislation was written to keep a municipality from holding on to their guns for long periods of time and that guns may disappear and that proponents want these guns out on the market. But I want to ask the question, what if a municipality wants to decrease the number of guns on the market? How many guns are too many guns? How much is too much? Over 400 million guns in the United States, between police, military, and American citizens. Over 393 million guns, 98% are in civilian hands, equal to 120 firearms to 100 citizens. We have more guns than citizens in the United States. If a municipality wants to decrease the number of weapons on the market, they should be able to destroy them or to melt them down. You can save the guns that are the antiques and special and then sell them and melt them down. Many municipalities do that in other states and we could do that here. Sections five, six, and seven dealing with persons with mental health petitioning the court for a right to bear a firearm these sections are good. They are an improvement over current law, which allows for a person who has been involuntarily hospitalized to be automatically purged from the no-gun list. I wish that we could strip all other parts of the bill and keep these sections, five, six, and seven. I want to take a moment to talk about what Georgians really want to reduce gun violence. I know we all want that in this chamber. I'm talking about safe gun ownership laws and reducing easy access to guns. I've told you about my church, North Decatur Presbyterian, where once a month, we, uh, during our confession, we read aloud the names of victims of gun violence, at least 50 a month, murders, suicides, accidents. During the pandemic, it was closer to 100 Georgians a month, 1,000 precious Georgian lives lost to gun violence. Wisdom, justice, moderation, and we just added courage. Many of these gun deaths are preventable if we have the courage to pass safe gun ownership laws. I was disappointed that on the public safety committee's hearing on crime in Atlanta, we were never given the opportunity to hear from public health officials who have researched gun violence. I think we would have greatly benefited. 
I'm thinking about law laws like red flag laws that prohibit convicted domestic violent abusers from holding a gun. I'm thinking about training of firearms and safe gun storage. Requiring training in firearms use and safe gun storage could save hundreds of Georgian lives each year. When I went to DC this, this fall, my neighbor, excuse me, my college roommate, Carolyn, told me about her nephew, Max Williamson, who was cleaning his gun in his apartment and it accidentally discharged. He went, the bullet went through the wall. He went to his neighbor's apartment and knocked on the door and no one answered. He left a note and went out of town. When he returned on Sunday night, he found out that the stray bullet had gone through the wall and killed his neighbor, who was also a mother. Now his young life is potentially wasted as he faces trial for killing this young woman. When my, when my, when my college roommate researched guns going through walls, accidents, there were countless stories of this happening. It doesn't have to be this way. For example, in hospitals, a lot of patients were dying of hospital-acquired infections. Doctors with public health background helped them figure out by following strict checklists and protocols for sanitation that these numbers could be drastically reduced. What if we applied the same level of detail and accuracy so that people were following a detailed checklist every time they cleaned their guns? and safe gun storage. I am so tired of hearing about children killing children with unsecured guns they have found in parents' homes and cars. I know many of you practice safe gun storage. Why wouldn't we want all Georgians to practice safe gun storage? Colleagues, I ask you to vote no on Senate Bill 259. And no matter how you vote, I ask that you ask yourself, what can I do, what can we do to prevent gun murders, to prevent gun suicides, and to prevent gun accidents? Mr. Speaker, I yield the well. Lady has yielded the well. Chair recognizes Representative Park to speak to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to strongly oppose this bill, Senate Bill 259. This is a dangerous bill because it will allow more guns into our communities, which will increase the risk of gun violence. Y'all, this bill puts guns before God. Literally, it strikes the words place of worship seven times on lines 48, 49, 50 to 51, twice on line 50 to 52, and on line 65 to 66 and 67 to 68. Striking out the words place of worship in Georgia law will allow anyone to bring a gun into your church and mine in rural Georgia and downtown Atlanta and impose an unnecessary burden on churches by requiring churches to put up signs that say guns cannot be brought into these places of worship because Georgia legislators in an election year thought it was good politics to put guns before God. Now, if y'all are so scared that you need a gun with you at all times, everywhere you go, including church, y'all need more Jesus. Do you know what the most frequently made commandment in the Bible is? Do not fear. 365 times. We cannot allow our fear to guide public policy in this, in this state, especially when it comes to gun violence. Under current law, a license holder who brings a gun into a place of worship, a church, mosque, synagogue, or temple, cannot be fined more than $100 and cannot be arrested. Under current law, if you're not a license holder and you bring a gun into a place of worship, it is only a misdemeanor 
per OCGA 1611-127, subsection E2. This bill strikes out these minor penalties in state law on lines 65 and 68. Now, I would argue that fining someone for bringing a gun into a, into a church is not an unconstitutional infringement of the Second Amendment. I would further argue that the belief that the Second Amendment is absolute or that our founders intended that there be no regulation on the right to bear arms is a extreme, radical, misguided, and, inter and dangerous interpretation and application of the Second Amendment, especially when it comes to firearms that can be modified to become semi-automatic-esque weapons of war that belong on a battlefield, not our neighborhoods or communities. Now, don't get me wrong, I support the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms. I appreciate and value this fundamental constitutional right to protect myself and my family and as a safeguard against tyranny. After my family business was robbed at gunpoint around a decade ago, we got a 40 caliber Glock to protect ourselves. However, no constitutional right, including the right to bear arms, is absolute. And certainly, a state law that prohibits a gun in a place of worship is not an unconstitutional infringement of the Second Amendment that would threaten our democratic republic compared to, say, trying to stop the peaceful transfer of power or a threat to this country, such as trying to undermine the rights of citizens to vote. Like many other bills debated this year, this bill once again undermines local control. In section three, lines 115 to 119, it prohibits any municipality, county, or consolidated government from prohibiting the discharge of a firearm on a parcel of land that is 10 acres or more. What if this 10 acre parcel of land is next to an elementary school, a nursing home, a hospital, how many 10-acre parcels of land exist in the metro Atlanta area? Is it too much to ask members in this body to respect local control with the understanding that the needs of urban and suburban Georgia may be different to the needs of rural Georgia? Now, in section four of this bill, lines 139 and 148, this section requires, it mandates, local governments to auction off any firearms they may acquire every 12 months if they obtain five or more firearms. How many local governments in urban and suburban areas likely have five or more firearms in their inventory compared to local governments in rural Georgia? I have concerns this bill will unfairly burden suburban and urban local governments and will increase the prevalence of firearms in more densely populated areas. If a local government does not hold an auction every 12 months, per line 142 to 143, a person simply interested in acquiring that firearm may bring a lawsuit. They may bring an action in mandamus or other proceeding to compel the disposition. The bill allows any interested person to sue local governments even if that person who sues a local government from a mandatory firearm auction doesn't get the gun. That's extreme, if y'all don't know. That is extreme. While anyone may bid and apparently sue local governments, lines 151 and 152 state that transfers of such firearms shall only be to licensed dealers and manufacturers. What do y'all think a licensed gun dealer is going to do with guns that they may obtain? Sell them, of course. And what do you think that's going to result in? This bill will put more guns on our streets, more guns in our communities and neighborhoods. As 70% of Georgians oppose concealed carry, I think it would be safe to assume that a majority of Georgians do not want to allow guns in places of worship and have more guns in our communities 
that increase the risk of gun violence in our neighborhoods. So if you want to do the will of the people, vote no to this bill. If you want to put God first, not guns, now is a time to demonstrate your faith with actions, not merely words. If you are pro-life and want to protect the life of all Georgians, if you want to protect your communities, vote no to this extreme, harmful, and radical bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield the well. Is there any objection to the previous question being ordered? The chair hears none. The previous question is ordered. We have a minority report. Have a minority report. Chair recognizes the minority caucus whip, Representative Wilkerson, to present the minority report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I know we have a lot of important measures to take care of the budget, the tax bill. So I promise not to take more than 18 of the 20 minutes I'm allotted, so. Um, I'm here today to speak against Senate Bill 259. Um, this legislation is not needed, and if you refer to your booklets, um, the minority party has filed a report in opposition to Senate Bill 259. We actually did that back on April 1st of 2022. Um, the minority, we disagreed with the committee's due pass recommendation of Senate Bill 259. Senate Bill 259 is more guns in more hands in more places bill. It forces churches to post, notice, and file trespass charges simply to enforce the right to be free of firearms. It preempts local communities from attempting to keep families and neighborhoods safe by setting common sense on limits on when and where individuals can carry firearms. Uh, finally, it preempts local jurisdictions from making the choice in the best interest of their local community as to how to dispose of confiscated weapons by forcing auctions of five or more firearms. As such, we urge this body to vote no. And then in accordance with Rule 56 of the Clerk of the House, we filed this minority report right here, and we submitted it to everybody. Um, so many of you may ask, what is Rule 56? As we debate this bill, you may ask yourself, what is Rule 56? Um, so Rule 56 is actually that all reports of the committee shall be in writing wherever practical. Each committee shall include in its report on each general bill or resolution a brief resume of the bill, and that's what we did here. We talked about what was wrong with this bill. Um, and if the committee wants to the, so order, the clerks give a majority, they print it, they distribute it to the members of the House, and the majority, the minority of the committee must do it, but not less than two members may make it writing. So what that means, basically, if you have four people that vote no, we have to get at least three. Now, if there's three Democrats and two Republicans, it kind of muddies it up a little bit because we have to get at least, you know, majority of both parties. And that gets a little hard sometimes. Um, so I've kind of explained what led us to where we are right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm, the chairman of my good friend walked through the bill a little bit, but a lot's going on and we're really busy and we've got a lot to do. So I'm going to walk through it again, if, if you're okay with that. You okay with that? You okay with that? You okay with that? Okay, so <laughs> chapter 11 of Title 16 of the Georgia Code of Georgia Annotated. In the beginning, now tonight you have to be careful because usually this tells you what the bill's about. But today there may be some things like earlier I thought I was voting at casinos and it was trees. So I just want the voters to know that sometimes as we are making good legislation, the, the titles get changed sometimes. So I'm going to move into the bill because it has some things that change. We, we, we changed the definition of a place of worship. Um, on lines 52 and 53, we strike out in a place of worship unless the governing body or authority of the place of worship permits carrying of firearms by long gun holders, by license holders. And then further, we, 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 we kind of, 65 through 68, we remove the fines. Uh, 
Oh, you, you're, the, the majority whip told me I lost my place, so I'm going to go back a little bit. So yeah, 65 through 68, we struck that out. And then on lines 79, though, I am concerned about involuntarily. So we, we removed the voluntary hospitalization and say, as long as a person knows that something's going on and then you have to, you, you force them into the hospital, then this applies. But if they go willingly, even though they have an issue, then um, this doesn't apply to them. Um, 95 talks about the database prohibition. The term multi-jurisdictional should mean two or more, between among more than one department or agency. Because when you have multi-jurisdictional, you know, it's multiple, it was kind of like, what was that movie? Um, Eddie Murphy, 40, it wasn't 48 hours, Beverly Hills Cop, it was a multi-jurisdictional task force because it was multiple jurisdictions that were task forcing together. So that's what that, that kind of means right there. Um, so we move on to 115 and 116, the 10 acres or more. 10 acres is kind of random because I know in Cobb County we do have some pieces of land that could be right next to a neighborhood that have 10 acres. So the 10 acres is kind of arbitrary. We could have said 15, we could have said five, but 10, I think, is very arbitrary. And for a bill this important, I don't think we should be arbitrary. We could have worked together to kind of clean up that language. Um, I've got mandamus. Mandamus? What's my attorney's? Mandamus? Mandamus. I played, I went to school to get mandamus. That, it's like a writ of law, mandamus. Um, so, what was that? Okay. So, as you walk through the bill, you can see that um, there are some parts that people may like as we move on to, you know, lines 206. I know a lot of people worked on that, but you can't just take a piece of the bill and vote on a piece of the bill. You have to vote on the bill all in totality, right? In, in totality. So I'm asking you to look at every underline and added line um, and look at it together. Um, and I do want to thank you all for walking through this with me. You're welcome. And as we go to the um, end of the bill, I think that pretty much covers most of it. Um, section 8 talks about ammunition reloading. And then... Um, Well, wow, this is interesting. Um, we move on to the prohib prohibition of manufacture sale of firearms and ammunition. So as the speakers before me said, um, this is not the time nor place for this type of legislation. And that's why we filed the minority report in accordance with House Rule 56. And I will ask you to please um, strongly consider Look in your heart. Think about your family and friends. And I'm asking you, to really think about what this bill does to Georgians and to vote no. Mr. Speaker, um, I try not to take up the whole time, but I would yield to any questions if there are any. Mr. Speaker, I believe there's no question, so I will yield the well. Thank you. Gentleman has yielded the well. Previous question having been ordered, is there any objection to adopting the committee substitute? The chair hears none. The committee substitute is adopted. Is there any objection to agreeing to the report of the committee, which was favorable to the passage of the bill? The chair hears none. The report of the committee is agreed to. Shall this bill now pass? All those in favor of the passage of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no, and the clerk will unlock the machines.
Have all members voted? Have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machine on the passage of Senate Bill 259. The ayes are 94, the nays are 67. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. Chair recognizes Chairman Werkheiser for a motion. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I move that this House adopt the Conference Committee on House Bill 1425. Chairman Werkheiser has moved that this House adopt the Committee of Conference Report on House Bill 1425. The clerk will read the conference committee report. The Committee on Conference on HB 1425 recommend that both the Senate and the House of Representatives recede from their positions and that the attached committees of conference substitute for HB 1425 be adopted, respectfully submitted for the Senate Watson of the 1st, Strickland of the 17th, Burke of the 11th, for the House of Representatives, Werkheiser of the 157th, Holcomb of the 81st, Gravely of the 67th. Chair recognizes Chairman Werkheiser to explain the Committee of Conference report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is a sizable bill, but I'll, I'll go through it really quick. But I've got to thank some people first. Uh, this has been a multi-year process. I want to thank the Speaker's office um, for his involvement and for getting behind this so that we could get this moved along. Lieutenant Governor's office, uh, Governor Kemp and his army of lawyers who uh, kept us in check and then the conferees. Uh, we had three lawyers, two doctors, and then there was me, so I guess I get to, to read it. Um, real quick. Uh, section 2 adds, as you know previously, we had a class 1, or two class 1, which are large licenses, and four class 2s. We're adding a class 3, which is the same as a class 1, and a class 4, which is the same as a class 2. We'll get to that later. Section 3 is fines and remedies for violations. Section 4 is the dispensaries, uh, the rules and regulations for those developed by the State Board of Pharmacy, which gives five dispensaries per all four classes, and that's the same for the land-grant universities. Section five is the Medical Cannabis Commission Oversight Committee. Section six and seven states that DOAS, uh, Department of Administrative Services, not the commission, shall develop a process for um, reviewing class one and two licenses uh, in the event that a license has been revoked or surrendered and there's a replacement. Uh, section eight, this gets into the class three, which is again the same as a class one, so it's the 100,000 square foot facility, and then two more class fours, which is the same as a class three, which are the 50,000 uh, square foot facilities. Um, no new application fees will be acquired. Uh, you've got to have product uh, in 12 months and then no state employee or elected official cannot own more than 5%. Uh, section 9 requires a tracking system for the product. Section 10 requires a retrospective study on minority and women um, owned businesses. If the requirements are not met, a license can be awarded to replace that. Section 11 changes the 3,000 foot barrier down to 2,000 feet. Section 12 is uh, explains the testing of the product for potency, foreign matter, pesticides, and other uh, related items. Section 13 is protecting trade secrets and balancing what should be discovered through open records um, and to clear up all that confusion we've had here recently. Section 14 is the, I guess, the meat of it and the big change. So as you know, we've got, uh, 
six folks out there who are potentially awarded a license that this allows the commission through using the Department of Administrative Services to review the scoring, not to rescore, but to review, and then using a third party consultant to, and then get back with the commission by June 7th. And then uh, wrapping it up, all protest and uh, lawsuits will now go straight to the statewide business court and then the commission shall issue a new request for proposals for those other 63 people provided that they drop their protest and or lawsuits and they will be eligible to, to apply for those three and fours. And that's the bill. Our whip is telling me to hurry up. So if you got any questions, ask him. Do you have some questions if you yield? I'll do maybe one or two. Chair recognizes Dean Smyrie to your left for a question. <clears throat> uh, to the gentleman, yeah, you yield. Yes, sir. You know, when we start talking about this uh, cannabis and, uh, and the last bill we had, now, correct me, on, on this one, how many licenses are included in class one and class two? How, how many total licenses are we talking about? There's going to be nine total, so class one is is going to be the original two. Class two is going to be four. Class three, which is the same as the one, is going to be an additional one. And then, then class four, which is equivalent to a class two, is going to be two more. So if my math is right, that's nine total licenses. So, so I want to make sure that the, the gentleman, in the last bill we had, there were six license two and four in, in both classifications. Those right? stay. They, those stay. Yes, sir. So this is a, additional there. We're adding uh, three more. Okay. One last question. Yep. Um, Fort Valley and the University of Georgia were given discretionary power in, in our last uh, piece of legislation. In other words, they had direct opportunity to go directly to the marketplace and partner with, uh, with, with the University of Georgia could partner and Fort Valley State could partner with, with someone in the business to retrofit, retrofit their area. Is that, that this That's all, that stayed in the bill. Okay. Right. And so far, Fort Valley has participating. University of Georgia is kind of standing back on that right now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I'll take one more. Chair recognizes Chairman Powell to your right for a question. Parliamentary inquiry. This is not a question. That's to you. Sir. Is this directed to the- Oh, well, the gentleman yield. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to look through this bill. Me too. Uh, if the gentleman might tell me, we knew that when we looked through the uh, interview, the Cannabis Commission, there appeared to be a considerable amount of concern that we had in the committee uh, that dealt with accusations that of those first six that were tentatively granted, that a lot of them weren't eligible. Notably, one in particular that stood out to me because they had a facility that was within the 3,000 foot boundary of the current law. And now I see in this bill on page 16, line 390, that y'all in this report, that y'all have now reduced that 3,000 to 2,000 feet. Could you explain to me what that change was made for? Because the 3,000 was close to a half a mile, and we looked at comparison to even the alcohol, which is 1,000 feet. This puts it 50% greater than that. It was just from the beginning. It was not to protect that, whoever that potential protestee was. Uh, from the beginning, it, that number was too high. Well, the gentleman further yield. Yes, sir. I understand what you said, but under the terms of the law that was passed three years ago that licenses were, were supposedly uh, scored and graded on, this company would have never been, should have never been included for consideration by virtue of being outside the boundaries. But with all appearances, it seems like we're trying to fix something after the fact that I have concerns is going to promulgate more litigation that we already know is going to come. Would you agree or disagree to that? Well, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what I think. Uh, the, in a room full of lawyers, uh, they determined that because this is a, this bill 
repeals parts in the previous bill that since there's a brand new uh, bid process that that would go away just so it would not have an effect on any current lawsuit further, but again, inquiry. You can further inquiry sure all right we've created three new licensees so who will be eligible to bid on those three the other 63 folks who who would not be awarded the first six and they would not have to pay a fee but they would be eligible uh, as long as there is a stipulation there that there is not a pending protest or a lawsuit from that company that would disqualify you so are you saying that a company can abrogate their legal rights if they don't follow up with litigation if they filed a protest is that what you're saying say that in layman terms let me repeat that so you're saying that one of the 16 protesters that would possibly be considered for one of the three licenses but are you saying that they can't go through with that petition if they have filed litigation that is what i'm saying they would have to drop that if they want to be eligible for one of the three additional licenses i'm not an attorney but i don't think that you can give up your rights especially after a law has been passed in effect that another law was was not or the process wasn't correct thank you sir thank you and with that mr speaker i'm going to yield the well and ask for your favorable consideration the gentleman has yielded the well on the adoption of the conference committee report on house bill 1425 all those in favor of the adoption of the report will vote aye those opposed will vote no and the clerk will unlock the machines <clears throat> what purpose does representative Bodie rise parliamentary inquiry state your inquiry miss speaker on line 358 is it not true that minorities and women would not be considered for a study until 2025 as opposed to January the 1st, 2022? Uh, Representative, Speaker, I have not read the conference committee report yet. I'm, that's why I'm not voting. So, I mean, if your gentleman says that, I have no reason to question it. Uh, what purpose does Representative Fry rise? He waves. What purpose does uh, Chairman Workheiser rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Uh, to my friend uh, in front of me, the reason those dates actually are not really any different than the previous iteration, we just moved it back because we're two years further down the road and we're actually looking whether those companies complied with the minority and women-owned participation. So it's not that we're delaying it, we're, tr we're making sure that they do comply. And if they haven't complied, then the commission has the ability to assign a new license that does fit the women and minority-owned requirements. Okay, have all members voted? Have all members voted? Have all members voted? What purpose does Representative Bentley rise? Parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Speaker, is it not true that I believe that this bill would be very helpful to Fort Valley State University, which is the only land grant institution that's also a historically black institution for higher learning in the state of Georgia? Is that not true, what I believe, Mr. I'm Speaker? I'm sure the lady does believe that. What purpose does Representative Camp rise? Parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Isn't it true that the longer that we delay bringing medical cannabis oil to the citizens of our state, the longer they are suffering and having to do things that are not always legal to get the medicine they need to their children and family members? Uh, I think the lady uh, has spoken the truth. All right, final call. Have all members now voted? What purpose does the majority leader rise?
parliamentary inquiry. State your inquiry. Mr. Speaker, isn't it true that we uh, first addressed this issue in 2014? And we addressed this issue to help the, those in need in this state. And today, tonight, we are finally, isn't it true that we finally come up with a plan that is fair to all concerned? And isn't it further true, Mr. Speaker, this addresses a need that's a desperate need for the citizens of our state to utilize this product that makes a huge difference in the health of the people of this state? Isn't that true, Mr. Speaker? I believe that is to, uh, true, Mr. Leader. All right, have all members voted? If so, the clerk will lock the machines on, on the adoption of the conference committee report on House Bill 1425, the ayes are 95, the nays are 73, and this House has adopted the committee of conference report on House Bill 1425. Chair recognizes or I'm sorry, the clerk will read the caption to Senate Bill 441. Senate Bill 441 by Senator Hatch of the 50th Gooch of the 51st and others to be entitled an act to amend Title 15 of the Fish Code of Georgia and data relating to courts in general so as to provide for the reestablishment of the criminal case data 